Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Today we're going to take a look at this lovely Mixig uh, MS310IT, 100 megahertz, one gig sample per second, handheld, multifunctional, multifunctional, instead of multifunction, multifunctional. Okay, multifunctional oscilloscope. And if you don't know about Mixig, they're an up and coming uh, Chinese uh, manufacturer, but they're trying to shoot for the high-end stuff, and this is, you know, a reasonably high-end uh, handheld scope. There's a $5,000 model of this. This one's about $1,400 uh, street price, which is a uh, really good value for a supposedly, really, it feels like a brick dunny. It is built really solid, feels like a quality bit of kit, and they're trying to compete against the uh, Agilent. So um, the higher-end model of this is upwards, like for $4,000 or something uh, US which is uh, pretty much on par with sort of, you know, the um, Agilent and uh, Fluke prices. And of course, the uh, selling point of handheld scopes like this is this one is fully isolated uh, between both channels. So these um, B and Cs are not electrically connected. We can put a multimeter on there and prove it. And also the uh, multimeter input as well, also electrically isolated from both of the channels. So they're all three independent channels. Um, at the BNC, uh, 300 volts Cat 3 rated, which is pretty darn good. And uh, 600 volt uh, Cat 3 rated on the multimeter input and they're all isolated and let's prove it so let's probe that and we'll show you that they're genuinely isolated look at that no worries whatsoever that's what you need on a handheld scope isolation and of course to make them safe you also need the proper uh, isolated probes as well so they've got the full plastic uh, shroud surrounding the BNC so when you plug it in you can't accidentally touch that uh, BNC and also uh, for the um, oscilloscope probe here itself it's got this retractable clip here so uh, for the high frequency uh, probe attachment here so you can't accidentally touch any of that so it's all fully isolated fantastic these are uh, quite reasonable 100 megahertz bandwidth uh, rated probes and they're actually manufactured by multi-contact there you go um ul uh listed as well fantastic so no wackers there at all and uh there's the specs for those playing along at home oh where's the english ones there we go 16 path input capacitance compensation range all standard 200 0 to 250 megahertz it says uh 100 megahertz on the probe. So that's strange, not sure what's going on there. And for those who have been wondering, where's David 2? There he is, over there. Many people have asked to see him. There he is. So yes, I'll have to do a separate review of this. And yes, it is, I've uh, been using it a bit. And yes, it is a very nice handheld scope. So if you're in your market for a uh, quality isolated uh, scope, it's worth a look. Now, let's have a look at the thing. One thing I don't like about the tilt-in bail on the back is usually like they put in like a little cut out there to get your finger under but uh, it's like you know they've just got these little finger holes on the side to flip out the tilting bail and you know it's a <laughs> quite a decent wide tilting bail I like it but yeah just can't get the damn thing up I hate it when you can't get your stand up so anyway you know what we say here on the EV blog don't turn it on take it apart with our Swiss tools well, actually, I can't do that because that's of Philips and their talks. Uh -huh. So have a quick look at the battery. It's supposed to have a uh, four to five hour operational life. I haven't actually tested that. Um, but uh, let's get this puppy out of here. And there we go. Mixig uh, branded, 6,000 milliamp hour. But you could, uh, you know, repack that yourself, I'm assuming. Well, maybe not. It's, yeah, welded shut. But anyway, well can buy a new battery pack from Mixig if it ever dies, but uh, yep, there we go. We've got ourselves, is that a warranty void if not removed sticker? Okay, this is annoying. There's two other screws in here and uh, I've got to sort of get right at an angle. Okay, well that's weird. These are different lengths. That one came out of there and that one came out of there and the other ones are also a different length again. Why? Here we go. And, wow, we're in like Flynn, right to the good stuff. Look at that. Oh, Altera Cyclone 3. Woohoo! All right, well, this looks very nice. Look at how they've uh, 
got this, and this is the main uh, processor board, by the way, if you hadn't figured it out with the FPGA and a Texas Instruments TMS320. Thank you very much, old school. Um, yeah, look, at they've got the uh, the grounded vias right around the outside, just trying to stop the uh, magic electrons from escaping and uh, mucking up their um, EMI, but very little is going to escape out there. It's just, it's killed in the lily, you know. But anyway, it's nice, but look at it, you know, all ground vias everywhere around here. Anyway, we've got some uh, DC to DC converters up here for, uh, they're going to be for various rails. We've got a um, TMS320 processor. We've got a uh, Altera Cyclone 3 FPGA, um, not particularly you know, high end, but uh, good enough to do the job. This has got, um, this model I think has 60,000 waveform updates per second, whereas the highest end one has like 160 or something, or 200,000 waveform updates per second. Really quite a fast scope. And we've got ourselves an EP316F484, uh, sort of like, you know, one of the mid-range uh, type Cyclone 3 parts. It's, we're looking at uh, 15,000 uh, logic elements, not a huge one, and uh, 512k bits of internal uh, SRAM. So they're clearly not using this as the sample memory because this thing has uh, 240 uh, K uh, per channel, I think. I'm not sure if it halves or not, but yeah, uh, 240K. So they obviously can't fit it all inside the Altera Cyclone. So there's going to be some memory next to it. And sure enough, right next to the FPGA, there's two of these puppies. Uh, pretty common as mud in these sorts of uh, scopes, ISSI. Um, 256K uh, times 18 bit wide, uh, 4 megabit. Well, you can actually choose different widths. Um, 4 megabit... Um, SRAM, no, this SD RAM rubbish, no, SRAM, thank you very much, easy to drive with the FPGA, and super quick, and there's two of those, so, um, yeah, this thing's got 240k of sample memory, so they're, they could at least double that, they could have uh, 512k samples, because there's only 8 bits per sample. Actually, is that the same? Looks like it is. Um, they've actually got three of these, so... I'm assuming that there's one per channel for the uh, sample memory, and the other one... Video memory would be my guess. And there's a good old-fashioned old-school TMS320 in there for all you uh, 320 fanboys. I know there's a lot out there, and they're still as relevant today as they were... Well, I don't know, jeez, when did they first come out? Jeez, would it be 30 years? Ooh, 320s. TMS320, Days of Fanboy. Woo, TMS 320s. <laughs> He's a fanboy. And this segment is brought to you by Texas Instruments. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us why you like the TI320, TMS 320. Yeah, so I'm using it in the 3D printer board. It's superb for control stuff. It has like, the, it can do like complex number maths and like, it has this like... Hence um, its name, Digital Signal Processor, that's their job. It's fantastic for control. <laughs> yeah, and it's got, um, what, what did they call it? Um, a control law accelerator, I think they call it, which sounds ah. like a... Which, which means that you, you basically have like this kind of like microcode engine type thing that mm -hmm. runs in the background and then you can use DMA, like direct memory stuff and transfer between data and it's like you have absolutely no overhead on... On the actual processor itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that just runs on the side. Yeah, yeah, so you can get yeah. ADC sampling, yep. convert all those samples to real numbers and um, put it into your main program like memory with like just with about no overhead, no processor overhead. Yeah, yep, that's what they're for. Memory. Not all of the three twenty parts would have that though. No, <laughs> you'd have to choose a specific one. Yeah, the TMS three twenty. Um, I think it's F twenty eight O sixty nine is the one that I'm using at the moment. It's pretty high end. How um, many variants would they have? Thousand. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right. I think it's a sixty eight, sixty something else, sixty two. Yeah. You're a fanboy. Yeah. All right, 320 for the win. Woo! <laughs> this one's actually a beast. Just like Dave said, this is the um, 6000 series, the 6748. And it's you know, 375 or 450 uh, megahertz, but it's got like 3,500 uh, MIPS and, what, 2,700 uh, meg flops, so it's a real hunkin' beast. So, yeah, they didn't skimp there. Things, that thing's hauling ass. Got some external memory on there, too. And I thought that puppy was uh, two little cells stacked there, but it's not. It's a um, SuperCap 
0.33 farads for all you Supercap fanboys. Well, hello, Sailor. This is our ADC from Intercell, the big eye on there, and uh, the, the CAD 5510P. I hadn't seen this before. Dash 50. This is a 500 meg sample per second uh, part, so obviously to get their uh, banner spec of 1 gig sample per second, they must be interleaving both uh, channels. I haven't even looked at the um, spec, but I'm sure if you do, it'll say that. But this puppy is not 8, it's not 9, but it's a 10-bit converter. Fan freaking tastic! Why have they got a 10 bit converter in there? That is brilliant. I wonder if they're how they're making how they're taking advantage of that. Are they actually sampling the full 10 bits or are they just, you know, pissing away two bits? I don't know. Well, I just checked the uh, specs for this thing and sure enough, it says that it's an 8 bit converter, but these are clearly 10 bit converters in here, so maybe they're using them using them for the um, extra performance and just tossing away the two bits. But that, that seems a shame. You could do some nice uh, boxcar averaging with that. But I don't even think this scope actually has any form of, um, you know, high resolution uh, type mode. A real shame, especially like I know you can't see it on the uh, screen, but it's good for uh, math uh, stuff. And also, if you want to capture the data and uh, export it, then, uh, you know, it's fantastic for that, too. So. Not sure what's going on there. Wow, they've <laughs> spared no expense, that's for sure. Oh, and by the way, our TMS uh, 320 processor also has an LCD uh, driver, so it can probably easily drive the uh, 640 by, uh, what is it, 640 by 480 LCD screen in this thing? No workers. And this is uh, rather interesting. Here's our two Intercell ADCs here, but we've got one little micro coax coming up here, like. I thought, okay, if they're going, you know, this top board is the ADC plus the processor board. You know, there it is, like hooked right into the, uh, the ADC hooked right into the Altera FPGA um, sampling subsystem there. But, like, yeah, I would have expected two cables to come over. But anyway, we've got some uh, headers here which connect the uh, top and bottom boards. So bottom boards must just be the front end preamp and um, isolation. And that's pretty much it. But interestingly, note these uh, little ground strips along here, and they've gold-plated those because, well, just, well, just left the solder mask off. The whole board is gold-plated, of course. Um, and so they're, you know, designating that as something special. Is that the trigger stuff? And if you check out, they've got some slots here as well. It's almost as if that was designed to have a metal can over it, and they haven't populated it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what they intended there, but no, nope, they haven't done it. And here's something you don't see every day. There's an 8051 processor flash based. Uh, presumably that's what the F stands for. I haven't looked up the data sheet, but that is right next to this ribbon cable which goes off. That would be the front panel keyboard controller would be my guess. And they've implemented that in their own little micro. Okay, nothing wrong with that. So that's actually uh, really smart, and they've, you know, spared no expense, gilded the lily there. They went, oh, well, we don't want to have to do that in our TMS uh, 320 processor. We don't want the extra little overhead of handling and scanning the keyboard. Bugger that. Let's just um, separate that out into a micro, and then this uh, little 8051 micro can then interrupt the uh, TMS 320 um, processor when you actually press the key and want to actually do something so there's more grunt there to update your screen and that puppy there at presumably like sort of you know one side is uh, presumably the output side of this thing that's an analog devices uh 4857 or ada 4857 and that's an 800 meg bandwidth uh voltage feedback op amp and the rest of the stuff in here is just all jelly bean you know 405 twos and uh nothing Nothing special, nothing much doing in there at all. 4051, Mux, huh. and no surprises for finding this right here. This is a uh, Texas Instruments CDCM6102 VCO designed to uh, take our little oscillator there. There it is. Not sure who's making that one, but that is, is that a 10 megahertz reference? Can't read. No, 26 megahertz. There you go. And that gen that's actually got uh, two uh, clock outputs, which can drive um, the two ADCs there. No workers. Nice part, that one. 
You know how I was confused with only one micro coax coming up here? I actually found the other one. It's over here, wedged in between these uh, DC to DC converters here. So, what the? That's got BB on there. Don't know if it's Burr Brown or not. It doesn't look like the original Burr Brown type symbol. It is. It's a Burr Brown part. There you go. Dave's nodding. David. Sorry. Um, DAC, uh, 7614, that's a quad uh, voltage output 12-bit uh, DAC, so they'd be using those for uh, all the um, offset stuff. Well, really impressed with this puppy so far. They're really gilding the lily on here. Let's uh, pop this uh, top ADC and processor board off. A um, couple of flat flexes here. This would be going down to the LCD. As I said, this one over here going off to the uh, touch um, uh, the uh, keypad uh, membrane on the front, so four screws, looks like, and get rid of those micro coaxes. They'll go out through the little holes in the board. Should just pop off, and we'll have our three isolated channels. Let's have a squeeze at those. So we've got our board to board headers. They're only like 0.1 inch, they're not like high frequency uh, headers, of course. So I believe that's why our two. Got our two coaxes. Surely that would be our two channels, our two analog channels. Ta-da! We're in. But you know, I I guess they had to. They probably, you know, they had to have it coming off because here it is over here. Here, you know, channels. Oh, one channel's over here. One channel's over here. So they had to put it in over here. But it's you know smack right in the middle of the DC to DC converters. You know, if I was the layout guy for this board. And, uh, you know, and the designer uh, came across and said, we want this, you know, analog uh, coax connector right there, smack in the middle of the DC to DC converters. I'd be going, oh, can't do that, can't do that. Oh, I'm going to need extra layers on my board to run it through an internal channel so it, uh, you know, avoids any uh, switching noise and stuff like that. But, eh. I'm sure they've done their homework on that. You know, it's not insurmountable. Um, it's just, you know, not ideally done, that's all. Yeah, for those wondering about the back of the board, uh, yes, it is double-sided low, but not much doing there. Just all your requisite uh, bypass caps for the uh, BGA. There's no real avoiding that. When you've got a BGA, FPGA like that, you can't just whack your caps around the outside. You don't get the uh, performance. Your loop areas are terrible, which diminishes the uh, effectiveness of your uh, bypass capacitors. So, yep, they've got to go right on the pins, right in the bottom. So... You know, that's the penalty you pay when you go for a BGA, FPGA like that. You're instantly whacked for the extra cost of a double-sided load. This is all rather very nice. Our little uh, plate here comes off with our uh, USB here. And we've got a uh, rotary encoder wheel. That just uh, pops out. They've greased that up. You've got to grease your wheels. And uh, we can two screws on here. We should be able to lift this whole board out. But uh, yeah, we've got ourselves a uh, shielding plate, some relays. Sticking out, oh no, they, no, they're not relays. I think they're uh, DC to DC uh, isolator blocks, perhaps. So there we go. That's just going to pop out of there like that. No whackers. We've got a couple of spaces which uh, came out, but we we're in like Flynn. Okay, this is kind of a what the? Look at this. There's an unsoldered pin there, and it's actually still inside the socket there. It's actually pulled through. So I, I don't know what the deal is there. What the? So apart from that bizarre pin sticking out, I'm thoroughly impressed at every turn of the uh, design of this thing. Here we go. Very nice. Look at our isolation slots in here between our channels. No worries whatsoever. So that's our analog uh, section. These are our... Uh, uh, sorry, our multimeter section and our two scope uh, front ends. Once again, it looks like they might, you know, they've done, well, the shielded can on the top. So they've, uh, you know, they're completely shielding that. They've got the individual um, stitched uh, vias down there. So, you know, they're forming one complete uh, ring and sort of can around that thing. And uh, we'll lop the can off in a second. But, yeah, it's really well laid out. We've got our isolation between our uh, ground, our um, processor ground side and our multimeter uh, input ground side, no problems at all. And as I guessed, uh, those black bricks there, I haven't looked at the part numbers, but they're uh, our DC to DC uh, converters. Typical um, single in line um, five pin arrangement here with the isolation slot down in there, you can see. 
So they're actually isolating the primary. So that'd be, you know, plus minus five volts in and, um, uh, sorry, five volts in from the digital side and probably plus minus five volts out uh, to power all of the analog section. Fully isolated. And they've done their isolation slots right. Very nice. And yep, I should have just looked, but I was right. Um, uh, AH0505, that indicates it's an 05. Uh, uh, that's five volts in and uh, five volts out. But because they've got the three pins on the output, that'd be uh, plus minus five volts. And it's Succeed brand, is it? Love it. Two watts. And check out that. It's Mark T2 transformer, but that looks like it's a uh, common mode choke to me. There is a matching one up here, but it's got the top on it. So I'm not sure why the top has fallen off that one down there. I, there's nothing rattling around in the case, so I don't know. It must have been that way before they put it in. Anyway, they're common mode choking the input between uh, to the um, isolated DC to DC converter here so that the crap doesn't, from the digital, doesn't uh, make its way because these things aren't magic. These are switching uh, converters and they're really, once again, gilding the lily there. I don't think I've ever seen somebody put a common mode choke on the input to that. Whew. And I was busy talking them up and I, what do you know, I've got a genuine bodge resistor there and they've also got another one around here. Where is it? There we go, they've bodged a little cap between those two pins. Oh, what a shame. And those puppies would be our opto isolators because the uh, ground split is right on the other side directly under those. So they've got those on the top side to uh, isolate the data because there's two things you need for a uh, isolated uh, scope like this. One is the isolated power, isolated DC to DC converter, and also the isolated data as well. So we've got ourselves our data isolators here. We've got ourselves our isolated power, but and some more uh, data isolation here for our uh, oscilloscope channel. But how do we get that signal across? Well, you can tell by the physical arrangement here. Here's our uh, coax going out to the main board. So that's our signal out. Here's our signal in. Ta-da! What do you think that does? It's an uh, it's an analog isolator to get the um, the hundred megahertz analog signal. Uh, that's the highest bandwidth of this thing across, so that's fully isolated because you can't because our digitizer is on this side, our ADC is over here on this on the um, non-isolated side. But unfortunately, that can is soldered in. Oh, boo hoo! And I've popped one side of this metal can here, and look at that! Oh, the cheeky buggers have rubbed the part number off. And then they've celastic gunked down either side. What the? That's their secret sauce. I don't want people knowing how they do their isolation there. <laughs> Anyone want to guess? And then on the bottom here, there's the isolation gap in the ground. You can see it right there. And then they went, well, will we or won't we uh, capacitively couple across the isolation? Yeah, but up here it looks like they've done it. And we've got the cans off both our uh, oscilloscope channel. I won't bother doing the uh, second channel because it'll be absolutely identical. And then our multimeter. Let's take a closer look at the multimeter first. Here's our multimeter input. Got some, we've got some diode protection over there, perhaps. And we've got ourselves a uh, MOVs. There was nothing on the bottom side here. They've got some isolation uh, slots. Curiously, we've got ourselves a 20 megahertz oscillator there. But what that's used for is it that device there we'll have to have a look what that puppy is but it's pretty minimal um set up anyway we've got like non-traditional multimeter uh type input doesn't have your traditional multimeter uh chipset that's for sure and that's what our oscillator is for that's a silicon labs um f330 that's actually an 8051 once again <laughs> they're 8051 fanboys at uh, mixing and that one's got a uh, built-in uh 10-bit adc so that's probably what they're using for the uh, multimeter there. Apart from that, um, everything, you know, once again, you see some uh, 4051s. Uh, and we've got an LM7332, just an op amp. 4052's got some more muxing happening there. And not much, not much really doing around this. Pretty boring. And that there is interesting. Q24. It's actually, um, by the designator Q, it's a transistor, and that's an N-channel, that's a 60-amp 
and Channel MOSFET. So, what are they doing there? Are they doing some switching or some form of protection? I've got two of those puppies in there. So, what's the go there? And let's have a look at our oscilloscope input. Got a couple of little uh, trimmer caps down there. There we go. Just to uh, tweak the front end performance there. Relay switching looks like a pretty typical kind of front end. And uh, there's our... Is our BNC? What's what's hanging off the end there? Why have they uh, heat shrunk that? Mm -hmm. What the? Another 8051! Are you kidding me? Inside the oscilloscope front end, they're obviously uh, doing that like serial decoding. Hey, what's that in there? Is that? Hey, look! Oh, that's no good. A little bit of solder dag there. Where'd it go? There it is. A little bit of solder dag. Don't know if I like that. Where did that come from? I, oh, must it maybe one of the front panel solder connections or something? Mm, yeah, they're a bit. Ugh. Yeah, they don't look the best. So there's our in serial programming header for it. So what they're doing is using these uh, remote processors on the other side of the serial interface because they've got to come across this serial interface here, right? So you've only got limited data lines like, you know, transmit and receive. That's basically it. And then, uh, this is, you know, you've got to have some sort of active uh, processor to uh, decode that. So I guess there's no surprise for finding a micro on there. And that's got H1F... Uh, 943 on it. I originally, my first guess was that it's a um, Hittite brand, but if you look up Hittite uh, 943, what is it, Dave? Uh, microwave power amplifier. Microwave power amplifier up to, what, 30 gig or something? It's for satellites. It's for, it's for <laughs> satellites. So, yeah, I don't think we're uh, into rocket science here today, so it must be something else. So, yeah, if you want to uh, find that one, go for your life. We've got another obscure part, HVB-051, whatever that is, um, some sort of output driver for the, uh, uh, for the uh, transformer, perhaps, for the isolation transformer, because you can see it. There's a signal buggering off over there under to the can, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I'll post um, high-res uh, photos of all these uh, sections, and you can have a uh, play along at home, follow the data sheet. So that is the front end board, and well, that's quite impressive. There's a few uh, potential uh, quality control production uh, issues there, but geez, no, that's it's you know that aside, um, it's a very impressive uh, bit of work. You're you know they really aren't cutting corners, and they're doing everything uh, properly, and I have no doubt it uh, meets all its. Uh, rated specs and everything else. This is a real high performance unit. It's not built down to a price. And well, you pay for it. Um, these things are, you know, these are not cheap handheld scopes. Mixig don't make cheap instruments. Doll, oh, put it back together, got all the ribbon cables and forgot the bloody encoder wheel, didn't I? Oh, I got the wheel back in. I forgot the bloody isolation pad. Unbelievable. I'm an idiot! Forgot the bloody plate! Oh, I think I'm going home. I should have gone home. Forgot to put the bloody strap thing in, holder in. Oh, this is not my day. So let's see if she works. Ta-da! Mixig, handheld multifunctional oscilloscope. <laughs> Hilarious. There we go. And... No worries. It's a quite, actually, it's quite a responsive um, scope. I've got no, I've <laughs> got to hold it up here. If I hold it in an angle, I get reflections off the lights and everything else. It's no good. It's actually quite a reasonably responsive uh, scope, like the fast waveform update rate. I really like it. And it goes from uh, 5 millivolts per division up to, have a look down there. Tonight, hear the relays click. Look at that, 50 volts per division. Ripper. Because um, that's one of the uses for handheld scopes. They're, you know, used out in the field, traditionally in sort of more, sort of, you know, industrial, higher power, you know, higher voltage uh, type environments. So at the BNC, to have 50 volts per division, that's very nice.
So yeah, I really like the performance of this. It's speedy, responsive, and everything uh, works a treat. But uh, one thing I do miss is an intensity-graded display, but eh, because it's a handheld scope, you know, not an everyday-use scope, then eh, that's all right. So, you know, no worries at all, but yeah, it just would have been a nice touch. And for those who haven't seen it, we can uh, go into meter mode as well. Just whack the button. Nice, big, bright display. Lots of functionality. It's all touchscreen, of course. And uh, there's capacitance, 10, nano, uh, 10 puff resolution. And uh, a continuity buzzer. I can check that out. Eh, it's a bit on the slow side. Okay-ish, but yeah, not the fastest. And its performance is nothing fancy. I mean, we're only talking, you know, 5,000 uh, counts. So, yeah, you know, it's got your basic functionality. It's good if you're out in the field. You, you know, shouldn't have to take a separate meter. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the teardown of that uh, Mixig uh, MS310IT. Uh, one gig sample uh, per second on single uh, channel only. Uh, 100 megahertz bandwidth, fully isolated uh, scope. And I'm really quite impressed. Mixig really know what they're doing. Uh, you know, design pretty first rate. A few little production issues, you know, small production issues, as I said, which uh, they'll get better. But, you know, they're basically new in the game, Mixig, and they're trying to compete at the high end. So, you know, if you're in the market for a decent quality uh, handheld scope, well worth a look, this puppy. And as always, I've got uh, high res uh, teardown photos over on EVE vblog.com and if you want to discuss it leave youtube comments or there was always a link down below to the forum thread which is all lively that's the place to do it as always if you liked it please give it a big thumbs up catch you next time